Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship at Eastminster. We're thankful for your presence with us today. Thankful for your participation as we join together to worship God. Hope that everyone will sign the attendance register you find along the center aisle at the end of the pew. And I hope that you will indicate anything there that will be helpful to us. I draw your attention to the announcements that you find in the bulletin regarding the events and activities that are taking place in the life of the church. There will be a very important deacon meeting tomorrow evening as we talk about our new pictorial directory. And you can see the announcement there that we will begin sign-ups for the uh, photographs next Sunday. Uh, don't worry if you're not here or uh, don't want to sign up yet because we'll have uh, several weeks, five or six weeks, where you'll be able to sign up. But we finally will have a new pictorial directory before the uh, uh, fall arrives, and we hope that everyone will be a part of it. You can see the uh, Nerf War for Youth is coming up on just uh, Friday night. They had another event. They had a lock-in, had 17 youth here, and our youth program is booming under the leadership of Trey Fulkerson. Hope that you will take note of all of the announcements that you find and that you will be a part of many of the activities going on in the life of the church. Hear these words of Jesus from Mark's Gospel. With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground, the smallest of all the seeds on earth, Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With these encouraging and challenging words of our Lord before us, let us worship God. Please stand for our opening hymn, Give Thanks. I would like this morning to have the chairperson of our stewardship committee, Ron Eisen, assisting in worship. And Ron will lead us this morning in our prayers of confession and also in the Apostles' Creed. Good morning. Good morning. Each of us has a mandate from God to give our best and bear fruit for God's realm. We who gather in God's house are called to be a faithful community in which all bow humbly before God, motivated by the love of Christ. This is a time to examine ourselves before our Creator. Let us join together in the prayer of confession that is printed in your bulletin. God, God of all truth, who can stand before you, we judge by our appearances, but you examine our hearts. We see what is on the surface, but you discern beauty deep within. We measure the importance by the paychecks, but you find value among those we deem lowly and insignificant. You offer us the deep and profound joy of living in your realm. We forget your promises and turn to pursuits that separate us from you and destroy communities. We seek forgiveness and a new direction for our lives. Amen. Now let's take a few moments for silent confession of our individual sin. All of us must stand before the judgment seat of Christ today and every day. When we come with true repentance, we can win a victory over sin. Christ died for us that we might no longer live only for ourselves. In Christ, we no longer regard others from a human point of view. We are a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. We can live confidently, urged on by the love of Christ to joyous daring service. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. But the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of the sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now unite our hearts together as people of faith as we offer our prayers to God. Let us pray. A holy and loving God in the silence and peace of this early morning hour, we come to you in wonder and in awe. We come in thanksgiving for the mystery that is you. We come overwhelmed by your creative power, by your saving grace, by your sustaining strength through all of life's trials. We give you thanks for the wonder and beauty of this world. We thank you for the sunshine of yesterday and the gentle rain that falls this morning. We give you thanks for the way in which you work in our lives. We thank you for choosing us for a specific task that only we can undertake. And we thank you for the special way that you call us to serve you. We thank you for the strength that you provide us to engage in that service. O oh Lord, you have placed within us a desire and for that which is good and true right. And so often we find that we push those holy desires aside and we look to lesser desires. And yet when we do, we find ourselves empty and longing for something more meaningful. O oh Lord, keep us on the right path. And keep us on that road that leads to fulfillment and joy and peace. As we observe and celebrate Father's Day today, we give you our special thanks for the men who model your fatherly love for us. We thank you for their strength, for their faithfulness, and also for their tenderness and gentleness. And we thank you for fond memories of fathers who have gone before us. And we thank you for the rich legacy they left behind of devoted service to you and to others. O oh Lord, may your fatherly goodness be with those in need on this day. And touch those who are suffering and those who long for their loneliness and heartache to be eased. And enable us to be your instruments of love and peace and fellowship in a world that is filled with pain and turmoil. And we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue our worship now as we offer our gifts to God. heard about a very unscientific poll of pastors that was taken recently. They said that pretty clearly Mother's Day is one of the big three in terms of worship attendance. It stands right alongside Christmas Eve and Easter. Third in line comes Mother's Day in terms of the worship attendance on that day. But then they added that Father's Day is at the very bottom of the list of 52 Sundays in terms of worship attendance. You can come up with all sorts of reasons for that, I suppose. But I'm delighted that we have a few fathers here this morning, and we extend you Happy Father's Day 
Well, the sermon is not specifically a Father's Day sermon. Now, certainly there is a message here that is for the fathers. Our scripture reading is among most important passages in the entire Old Testament. Now Samuel, the last of the judges of Israel, had been given the assignment from God to anoint Saul as the first king of Israel. Now it wasn't what God had wished for the people, but it was what the people had wished for themselves. And Saul became king because he was the choice of God. But when he disobeyed God, he was going to be replaced. And so God gave Samuel instructions to go to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse, where he would be shown who the new king was to be. Now, Samuel wasn't real excited to even go to Bethlehem, because it would surely have been an affront to Saul. And very strangely, God tells Samuel what he is to do so that Saul won't know the real reason for his visit to Bethlehem. He's supposed to say that he's going to Jesse's house in order to make a sacrifice. That was true. He was going to be offering a sacrifice while he was there, but that was not the main purpose of his visit. And there is very interesting irony here. Because the reason that Saul is being replaced as king is because of something he didn't do. He was ordered to kill all the Amalekites and their animals as well. He spared their king, and he also spared some of the animals. And he told Samuel that the reason he did so was so that he could offer a sacrifice to the Lord. That wasn't true. That wasn't the reason. So, in other words, Saul's lie becomes Samuel's ruse. The portion of this story that we will read begins in the 34th verse of the 15th chapter and of 1 Samuel, and it carries over to the 13th verse of the 16th chapter. It's 1 Samuel 15, 34 to 16, 13. Last week with our Vacation Bible School celebration, we looked at a children's story, the movie Ratatouille. Now, one of the reasons for doing so is obviously to provide something in worship on occasion to which children can relate and something that they just might enjoy. Another reason, though, is to make us aware that the gospel can be found anywhere. There is a story of good news all around us every day if we will simply open our eyes to see it. Now, as you hear this story of David being chosen as the new king of Israel, does it not remind you of another children's story? The children's story that we have previously used on Vacation Bible School Sunday. Is this not in many ways simply a biblical version of Cinderella? For you see, there were others deemed far more logical and far more worthy to serve in a royal capacity. But they were rejected in favor of a surprising alternative. Are there no other girls who live here? The, only the scrub girl, the, the servant. Jesse, do you not have any more sons than these? Only the youngest one, but he's out in the field tending the sheep. You see, this is the Cinderella story of the Old Testament. But what must David have thought when they sent for him? and brought him in for Samuel's selection process as really nothing more than an afterthought. It hurts to be ignored. 
ignored like that, doesn't it? To be just invisible to others. I remember being invited to a birthday party when I was quite young. In fact, I think I was only six or seven years old, and I was three or four years younger than all of the other boys who were invited to the party. And the reason I was invited was because the boy lived across the street from us, and my mother was going to help with the party. It made me feel pretty special, though, to be going to a big boy's party. And among the several games that we played was hide-and-seek. All of the boys hiding somewhere in the house and the birthday boy trying to find us. And the game wouldn't end until he found everyone. And I discovered a great place to hide. And I listened as one after another the boys were found. And finally, as I was crouched down in the dining room next to a china cabinet between the china cabinet and the wall I heard a gleeful announcement from another room that everyone had been found and the game was over and I remained there waiting for someone to notice that I was missing and no one did and they just moved on to the next game and I gave up hoping that they would realize that I was missing, and I just sheepishly joined them in that other room. Now, I'm not sure who felt worse when I walked into that room. Me, for feeling I was invisible and unimportant to them, or them, for knowing they had made me feel that way. And we're all guilty of that, though, aren't we? We're all guilty of either ignoring some of the people that God sends into our lives or seeing them as unimportant or, even worse, someone to be avoided. Remember the movie Crash? It was released in 2005. I didn't see it for a few years, but I finally did after at least a half dozen people told me I needed to see it. It's a movie about race relations in America. The most striking thing about it, though, is the way that it zeroes in on our first impression prejudices. We all see people and we judge them instantly, based solely on how they look. Now, this passage that we have just read is clearly a passage that focuses on those first human impressions and conclusions that we draw based upon what we see. Now we know that that is one of the main focuses of this passage because the word see or some form of it occurs eight times in these verses. God sees things in one way and we as humans see things in another way. And God tells Samuel that he is looking only at the surface. He says that God looks beyond that, and God looks inside a person's heart. God sees things that we don't see, even about ourselves. We see the world from our own point of view from our self-serving and self-centered way of looking at absolutely everything. Just a few years ago, the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles outside of Paris was restored to its original beauty. It cost $16 million, but it now looks very much as it looked to King Louis XIV in about the year 1684. There are 578 mirrors in that hall. And if you've ever been there, you know what an astounding sight it is. And you can walk down that hallway, almost a football field long, and look to a side and see nothing but yourself every step of the way as you walk. Now, isn't that the way we often walk through?
through life. Just looking at ourselves, thinking of ourselves, focusing on ourselves. Now what's interesting about the Hall of Mirrors though, is that if you look the other way, you don't see mirrors, but you see windows and you see doors. And those windows and those doors look out upon the gardens of Versailles. Arguably the most beautiful gardens in the entire world. And that's one of the supreme messages of this passage. Look the other way. Don't look at yourself. Look at the world from God's point of view and you will see something beautiful, something extraordinary, something magnificent. For this is the way that God sees. This is the way that God chooses those who are to be God's people. Now from all human accounts, David wasn't the one who should have been chosen. It should have been Eliab or Abinadab or Shama or one of those other older brothers that Jesse paraded one after another before Samuel. But God chose David. And when God chooses someone, they are chosen for a very specific task. There is something very special that God has in mind. And there is, make no mistake about it, something very special that God has in mind for you. I mean, it's not the big thing, maybe it's not the bold thing, maybe it's not the thing that all the world will be able to see. And yet it is a special task. And you are the one who has been chosen by God for that task. Great preacher, Fred Craddock, and talks about our natural human desire to do grand things for Christ. And Craddock says that for a long time in his life, that was his mindset. He says, I wanted to write God a check. My life. And now 50 years later, I think the largest check I have written to God is 87 cents. But then he says that he started thinking about little things that he's done. And continues to do. Continue, in committee meetings running to the hospital, talking to someone about their family, a funeral or a wedding, preparing a lesson. Very little things, really. The check's written for 39 cents here and 87 cents there. But as he says, the little things add up. And a whole life of them is just that. A whole life. A whole life lived for God. On my desk in my office, I have a clock that faces away from me. And the sign that faces me as I sit at the desk has something inside that I made and inserted several years ago. It says, one year, 12 months, 52 weeks, 365 days, 7,000, or 8,765 hours, 525,600 minutes, all for God. It serves to me as a reminder of what my purpose in life is. It reminds me that God has chosen me for a specific task. Sometimes but we don't want the task for which we have been chosen. And sometimes we don't want to be chosen at all. As Tevye says in one of his many conversations with God in Fiddle Around the Roof, I know, I know, we are God's chosen people. We are your chosen people, but once in a while, can't you choose someone else? See, you have been chosen.
chosen by God. You have been chosen for a specific task. As we look at this passage about David being chosen as king, an unlikely choice, it's very interesting that God also is rejecting Saul as king. <clears throat> and it seems to suggest that God can make mistakes. But I think we need to look at it in a different way. I think that it says that God takes chances. He took a chance on David, an unlikely candidate to be king. And God takes a chance on you as well. For the specific task, the very special role that you have been given in life, your little checks of 39 cents here and 87 cents there, you have to decide if you will choose to be chosen. Yeah, really, you're God's Cinderella. And he stands before you and he says, here is the slipper. The slipper that has been made specifically for you. Try it on. Because it fits. It fits you and no one else. He says, I'm taking a chance on you. Choose to be chosen. Amen. <laughs>